And a quick spoiler alert on my story, I also lost a bunch of my friends and family's money, so I think we're going to be we're gonna be three for three here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk today uh, not very much about RJ Metrics and more about uh, the failures leading up to RJ Metrics and how I'm not sure that it could have existed without them. Um, I, uh, I had a bunch of businesses throughout high school and college, so in high school I had the standard you know, web design business. Uh, with your local auto mechanics shop and, and whatnot. And in college, I had a college admissions consultant business and a business building software that built uh, algorithms to help people play poker better. Um, these were companies that were a lot of fun for me and felt a lot like success because in high school, I was building websites for 15 bucks an hour and all my friends were working at the Wawa making eight bucks. And that felt like a major, major win. Uh, and in college, uh, you know, I could make five grand by building some software that plays poker online. Uh, that's a lot of money for a college student. Um, and again, you know, gave me this bug of, I know that entrepreneurship is the thing for me that makes me uh, really tick and that eventually it's what I'm going to be doing. I think that the, the difference is today, looking back on those businesses, is that those businesses all sucked. Uh, like, they were great for me at the time, but knowing what I know today, uh, you know, I think one of the one of the things that I had to have in order to end up taking the plunge and doing entrepreneurship full time was being a little bit naive about what the criteria for success were. Um, and feeling like building a business was not about having that hundred billion dollar exit, but about having freedom uh, and having the ability to feel like I was dedicating 100% of my time to something that I wanted to do and that I had to leave. And with that, and with a couple of those uh, quasi-successes behind me, I graduated from college and uh, made a decision that, when I tell this story, is hard for even me to justify, which is that I decided not to take the plunge at that time. Um, I knew I wanted to start my own company. I had a huge ego and was extremely confident that I could do something and it would end up being successful. Uh, and yet I chose to take a full-time job uh, working in finance. Um, so I worked at a, a private equity firm. That firm was basically responsible for investing in software and internet companies. And my job there, as bottom down the totem pole, was to pick up the phone all day, every day, cold call CEOs, and try and convince them to tell us how much money their companies were making. Uh, and if I found one that sounded really interesting, it was growing really fast, uh, it's like boiler room, you call up Greco, and the guy runs over and takes the lead away from you, and hopefully it turns into a deal. Um, so, Doing that, uh, if you're really, really good at that job, then you do like one deal a year, first of all. So you make 100 calls a week, and out of those 5,200 calls a year, one guy says yes, and you're a rock star at this job. So it's a lot of rejection. But uh, I got lucky, and I had a couple people who said yes, and I got to do what's called due diligence, which is the part during a venture capital deal where you make sure that everything the person is telling you is true, and that as a venture firm, you really do want to do this deal. So you got a couple of weeks, uh, if you're lucky, you get 60 days to get really, really sure about it. And I was one of the only people at that firm with a computer science background. So uh, I ended up answering those questions using data analysis a lot of the time. Um, and it was very, very interesting uh, to kind of get a peek at the back-end systems that a whole lot of these really fast-growing uh, companies were running. Uh, but at the same time, at the end of the day, if my work was really successful and I found a company that looked great, uh, our firm slid a check for 20 or 30 million dollars across the table to somebody, and then my job was done, and I was back in the front. Um, and remembering the entrepreneurship experience that I had in college, you can only slide that check across the table so many times before you realize that you're on the wrong side of the table. Uh, and I got really uh, obsessed with taking the plunge. I wanted to quit every single day. All I would think about was, What's the idea? What's the idea? What's the idea? And I made this decision proactively to not take the plunge because I felt like I didn't have an idea. And then I got into this job and became obsessed with leaving so that I could take the plunge. And I still didn't have an idea. And that's when I made my first and probably uh, biggest mistake in this, which is I took the plunge uh, with an idea that was not fully made, uh, that I hadn't really thought out. And it was really conceived over, I was drinking a beer with my old high school calculus teacher. Um, over like a spring break or something, and he was talking about how the uh, a club he advised at the school was having a really hard time fundraising, and I had seen in my venture capital job all these people getting really rich on affiliate marketing, 
And I was trying to put two and two together, and I said, okay, if nonprofit organizations could use affiliate marketing to fundraise, then you might have a really interesting business on your hands. Um, granted, it's an extremely crowded space. The market needs to be enormous to uh, really crush it in an affiliate business, and my execution skills in that industry were close to zero. So, what did I do? Did I test the idea? No. I walked into my boss's office and I said, I think I need to step away from my job because I've got an idea and I'm going to go pursue it. And to my boss's credit, instead of kicking me out the door and saying goodbye forever, he said, all right, I'm going to let you go and explore this. Uh, you're not going to earn any bonus this year, but we'll keep you on the payroll and we'll keep your health insurance going. And you can go see if this is something you really want. Um, so uh, I give him a lot of credit for that. Uh, I went around to my friends and family, including some of my own high school teachers, who are, first of all, not accredited investors, uh, and second of all, you know, to whom like a five thousand dollar investment like means a lot. Uh, and I raised forty thousand bucks and blew it uh, by buying ads for a site that wasn't fully baked. I didn't have time to program it myself because I was working a full time job. So I hired a team in India and really mismanaged them and got this code base back that I did not understand in any way whatsoever. Uh, but got it online, burned through all this money, um, and with the last like, two or three thousand dollars that was in the bank, I was saying, how do I save this thing? How do I save this thing? And I decided that maybe I can expand beyond affiliate marketing and I can do all kinds of things for nonprofits. So build your mobile website, do analytics on your donors to see who might be the most valuable, uh, go out and help you uh, manage your call centers and software. And I got a couple of meetings with nonprofits in New York where I was working. And I met with all of them and uh, pitched them on this idea of this suite of software products. And the answer that I got from all of them consistently was, this is a terrible idea, I would never pay for it, uh, but if you tell me a little more about that donor analytics thing, uh, maybe I'll listen. And I realized that the donor analytics thing I was pitching was the same exact thing I was doing in my day job all day long, which was helping businesses, be they nonprofits or for-profits, use their data to make smarter decisions and tap into the data they already have to learn more about their customers and extract more value from them. And because of that, uh, it occurred to me that all this time, the business idea was right under my nose. Uh, and that uh, all of this investment I had made in trying to find ideas was really being incubated by the very fact that I took this job. Um, and that's when the idea for RJ Ventures was born. Um, and that basically, I took this, the company's called the Loyalty Corporation. I kept the same exact uh, legal entity and turned it into RJ Metrics Inc. Um, so that those friends and family shareholders would not get screwed. Uh, and basically, my friend Jake, who I worked with at Insight, became my co-founder at RJ Metrics. Uh, we wanted to bootstrap the company, so we moved to Philly so that we wouldn't have to pay New York rent. Um, and we grow the business down here. Um, and it has not been easy. Uh, we worked for 18 months apiece without any salary whatsoever um, before we got to a point where we could afford to pay ourselves $30,000 a year, which is what we made in that first year. Um, and it, it was a lot of sacrifice and a lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, um, but it uh, kind of got us on the path to building something that was really interesting. And I think the, the most key part of all that was the market validation behind the idea. Um, and I think that I probably made a lot of mistakes around the timing of taking the plunge and how I took the plunge, but I don't regret any of them because they've been so necessary in kind of finding and uh, you could say stumbling into the, the success that we've been able to find with, with this business. Uh, but that's, uh, that's the background.